Welcome to a Libertarian meeting this month. We meet every uh, uh, second Monday of the month. And today we have uh, John Lester continuing his uh, second part of his response to Walter Block's uh, criticism of David Freeman and libertarianism. A critique. <clears throat> the madman. Block cites Friedman's example of the madman who is about to open fire on a crowd. If he does so, numerous innocent people will die. The only way to prevent him is to shoot him with a rifle that is within reach of several members of the crowd. The rifle is on the private property of its legitimate owner. He is a well-known misanthrope who has publicly stated on numerous occasions that he is opposed to letting anyone use his rifle without his permission even if it would save hundreds of lives. <laughs> would you say that on numerous occasions? Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's what Walter Block says. What a <clears throat> and Friedman suggests that libertarian rights theory does not permit people to take, the, to take the rifle. But Block replies, based on a correct understanding of this perspective, some hero, you might remember him from last time, would grab the gun and stop the madman in his tracks by plugging him with his stolen firearm. Would he then owe a debt to the misanthropic sh shotgun owner? Yes, yes, of course. But it is very likely that any private court would go easy on this hero. I'm inclined to go along with Block as a practical solution. But in what way is it based on a correct understanding of this perspective, i.e. libertarian theory? The part about owing a debt to the misanthropic shotgun owner seems to fit libertarian theory that without a problem. But what about the rest? The idea that a hero simply flouts libertarian, theory, uh, libertarian property rights for the greater good does not solve Friedman's theoretical problem. Can we do better? One interesting possibility is libertarian consequentialism maximising the amount of liberty by whatever means necessary, including unlibertarian means. For the owner-flouting shotgun borrower would thereby be infringing liberty, but only in order to increase the amount of liberty by stopping the murder of innocent people. If liberty matters, then why not prefer such libertarian consequentialism? Libertarianism is never intended in this way in the literature, as far as I am aware. Problems with it are probably the same as with consequentialism generally. For instance, in less obvious cases, how do we compare different people's liberties? And how do we stop the undermining of liberty, the moral hazard, involved in allowing such comparisons, both by corrupt power and by people not behaving prudently? Libertarianism can itself be viewed as the right rules for rule preference utilitarianism, so it would be odd not to have the same view with respect to liberty, i.e. rule libertarian consequentialism requires libertarian deontologism. But what about very clear cases of exceptions such as the one in hand? I'm inclined to give a similar answer to the one I gave to a similar problem that Bar uh, Valentine posed in his encyclopedia entry on libertarianism. If someone fly, flouts a libertarian rule but later pays full compensation to the victim of the flouting, then the infraction of, li of libertarian deontology has been fully rectified and so it has not been band abandoned in favour of libertarian consequentialism. I can, of course, imagine all sorts of cases where we might want to abandon libertarian deontologism. But these thought experiments do not impugn the practical advocacy of libertarian deontologism. If this is not exactly the right answer to Friedman, then it is at least superior to Bloch's appeal to a liberty-flouting hero. However, Bloch himself <coughs> does give us a little more theory, for he continues that, according to Friedman, there is a conflict in rights between the right of the members of the crowd not to be killed and the right of the misanthrope to the sole use of the possession of his rifle. But for the libertarian there is no such thing. Whenever there is such a seeming conflict, one or both of the so-called rights is misspecified. Here the misanthrope has a clear right to his gun, but the crowd does not have a right, sorry, does not have a legitimate right not to be killed. 
Rather, this latter so-called right is not a right at all. Instead, it is an aspect of wealth or economic welfare. Of course, it is a most heinous rights violation for the madman to murder innocent members of the crowd, but that is another matter. This passage is somewhat confused. A few brief points in response. One, the crowd, i.e. each individual member, does have a legitimate right not to be killed proactively, i.e. murdered. Two, but if a third party does decide to save them in the way described, then there is a clash between their right not to be murdered and the gun owner's right to the control of his gun. It is just that. In this example, the clash is not direct, but only exists because of the actions of a third party. Three, it is probably slightly ideologically blinkered to restrict all legitimate rights to libertarian rights. For instance, a right to self-preservation, as famously defended by Hobbes, seems to be plausible to me. And we can easily imagine, at least in extremists, direct clashes between the right to self-preservation and libertarian property rights. Uh, for instance, a hiker who breaks into a cabin to save his own life, or a falling man who manages to grasp onto a flagpole and seeks entrance to an apartment to save himself. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll maybe have a brief digression on this because Friedman does write about these two examples in particular. <clears throat> in response to these two specific examples, Bloch makes three key points against their advocates. I summarise considerably. One, if force is used to protect property rights, even deadly force, the owner is not guilty of the violation of any licit law. Two, we are invited to empathise with the flagpole hanger and the hiker, not the respective property owners. Three, as long as these relatively rich libertarians have enough money to keep themselves from dying from poverty, the logic of their argument compels them to give every penny they own over and above that level to alleviate the plight of the endangered poor. This, that's from a Bloch's The Non-Aggression Axiom of Libertarianism. I respond briefly. One, grossly proportionate and deadly force in defence of one's property can itself proactively impose and thereby flout liberty. For instance, I put landmines in my garden to deal with the trespassing of local children who use it as a shortcut. Two, proper consideration of both sides in the examples given suggests that deadly force is itself immensely more of an aggression against the persons of the hiker and the flagpole hanger than their behaviours are aggressions, if they are aggressions at all. The fact that someone aggressed first cannot mean that anything goes in the name of defence of private property. Three, to assume that it is an illegitimate aggression to use deadly force against minor self-preserving trespassing simply does not logically imply that one is obliged to alleviate the plight of the endangered poor. From a libertarian point of view, one is not even obliged to help the, f the hiker or the flagpole hanger securing one's property from entry with locks, sturdy doors, etc. is fine. One is simply not able to shoot them or blow them up without becoming an aggressor oneself. Back to the text four. Libertarian property rights themselves can clash, as we have already seen in this essay, and when they do, it is the anterior pre-propertarian principle of maximising liberty that ought to be used to adjudicate the clash. Five, as partly explained by the foregoing points, all legitimate rights are more reasonably regarded as very strong prima facie rights rather than absolute rights. Six, none of this is to imply that compensation would not be due, even though one right had to give way to another. Of course, I could elaborate ad nauseum on all these points and deal with various criticisms, but I've already written about twice as much as Bloch's quoted passage. Contradictions in rights. Bloch rejects Friedman's quoted conclusion that there can be a right to commit a rights violation. Bloch argues that this is on a par with supposing that square circles exist 
A right to violate a right is a veritable contradiction in terms. But there is no contradiction in terms in the idea that some rights can trump other rights. A hierarchy of rights is perfectly conceivable. And so the view that rights are very strong but prima facie is also uh, entirely conceivable. Moreover, both these views seem to be true. The draft. Block quotes Friedman describing the circumstances of a hypothetical war with insufficient volunteer soldiers, no matter how high the pay, whereby even a libertarian would rather see himself and everyone else temporarily a slave, enslaved by his own government than permanently enslaved by someone else's. I should add that Friedman is, is supposing a particularly vicious totalitarian government. If the conquest is successful, we shall all lose most of our freedom and many of us will lose our lives. He is not supposing that this, uh, this case for the draft is at all realistic. The question is whether under any conceivable circumstances it could be acceptable. Bloch's reply is that given these unlikely circumstances, some hero would, should come forth and impose a draft on the populace. And afterwards, we prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law for mass kidnapping. But it is possible that no one will be willing to impose any punishment upon our hero. Finally, Block goes on to suppose that all the people refuse to fight and not a single hero steps forward to force them to do so, not even Block himself. <laughs> then that society deserves to be enslaved by the enemy. It is easy to imagine a fantasy in which libertarianism would not be the best ideology. That said, it is not obvious that Friedman has a cast iron example. Would it really be better to fight than to flee the country? Is a trillion dollar bounty not enough to have the leading political perpetrators assassinated, etc.? However, we could simply tighten the example to make it work. The point is that it implies nothing about the desirability as libertarianism as the best ideology for the real world for which it is advocated. Bloch does not need to fear that Friedman's fantasy uh, would count as a refutation of libertarianism and so think that libertarianism must some, somehow be shown to still apply. And he certainly does not need to add that without volunteers or a hero, such as society deserves to be enslaved by the enemy. This is a gratuitously anti-libertarian remark, analogous with, though, first, though far worse than, blaming a burglary victim for not having a burglary alarm or a rape victim for wearing a short skirt. Utilitarian libertarianism. Bloch decides that it is time to critically examine Friedman's utilitarian version of libertarianism. He immediately objects that it leads to nose counting. This appears to be a particularly weak version of the slippery slope argument. In any case, ignoring noselessness or multiple noses, this is otherwise better known as head counting or counting individual persons. This does not seem much of a criticism as it stands. Individuals are important after all. However, Bloch asserts that there are several key weaknesses in this perspective. Bloch's first main target is that utilitarianism sees utility as a cardinal, not an ordinal measure. He objects that it is impossible to meaningfully say, I value this pen at eight utils, this sandwich at 16 utils, therefore I value the latter at twice the rate of the former. The words impossible to meaningly, meaningfully say is a philosophical challenge. I think we might be able to make a sort of theoretical sense of cardinal utility and make it objective too. We could imagine a brain scan or chemical test that showed the extent of a brain's pleasure centres firing or its serotonin levels. After a little cal calibration with the person's subjective experiences, how do you rate this experience, positive or negative, 1 to 10, we could assign numbers to the different states that approximated to the de degree of the subjective utility and disutility. 
If consistent results were found over time, then even remote readings would match the person's subjective reports. Such a device would be a hedonometer or a hedonimeter, as the economist Edgeworth called it in 1881. It might even have practical uses as regards testing for pain or depression, possibly during a lecture <laughs> or a person in a coma or apparently in a coma. However, suppose that such a device is not possible, or at least insufficiently precise for consistent or consistent to function as cardinal, then, it, then its impossibility would appear to be a contingent fact about the world, and one that might change, rather than relating to what one can meaningfully say. As Karl Popper rightly observed, a statement is not meaningless because it cannot <coughs> currently be tested, although it is metaphysical. What is not science is not thereby nonsense and it might become testable science eventually, just as theoretical physics aims to do. Bloch then goes on to object to Friedman's utilitarian libertarianism, that it engages in interpersonal comparisons of utility, ICUs. If cardinal utility is nonsense, and it is, then ICU is nonsense on stilts. Mm -hmm. Here we must say something of the sort that Joe rates his shoes at 50 utils and Mary her bicycle at 150 utils and thus Mary values her possession at thrice the rate as Joe. If this isn't just plain silly, then nothing is. Having constructed our hedonometer, we might go on to compare people. Of course, similar readings might not mean similar levels of utility, but there are ways to test for this. One such is what a person would do in order to achieve or avoid a certain reading on a hedonometer. But we need not pursue this line of inquiry. The point is that it is not nonsense. It is simply not currently possible. Though thought reading brain scans are developing and uh, something like this might become possible eventually. However, a far more important point is being overlooked here. We can and do make rough and ready interpersonal comparisons of utility all the time. If Joe were shoeless and Mary bikeless, then we might well judge that a pair of shoes for Joe would give him more utility than a bike would do for Mary. Or we might look at two different societies and say that the people living under an authoritarian regime are far less happy than those living under a relatively libertarian society. And su such a general ICU seems to be both true and of practical importance. Of course, we would probably not bother to try to put a number to either of such comparisons, but they are interpersonal comparisons of utility nonetheless. Bloch appears to imply that precise numbers are required for any kind of interpersonal comparisons, but clearly they are not. Bloch's third objection is the assumption that all people have equal utility, insofar as utility to enjoy life is concerned. He complains that there is never any reason given to justify this assumption. It is merely blithely assumed to be correct. <coughs> so that's all right then. A universal theory cannot be rightly criticized for lacking epistemological justification. However, theory can be fairly criticised for being insufficiently explained, and that seems to be Bloch's point when he says that it appears to go against common sense. Bloch goes on to compare gourmets and wine connoisseurs and the cultured with their opposite. And Bloch questions the facile assumption that all individuals have the same utility functions. But he is careful, if unwittingly comic, in quickly denying that we can ever know any such thing one way or the other, since utility is ordinal, not cardinal, and ICU are invalid. We can say several useful things in reply concerning utility functions. One, there is nothing in utilitarianism that precludes making allowances for people who are gourmets and wine connoisseurs and the cultured. So ironically, Bloch is erroneous in his facile assumption that utilitarianism <coughs> involves the facile assumption that all individuals have the same utility functions. Two, 
Most people are not so radically different that broad utility comparisons cannot be made. For instance, Cateris Paribus, people who are starving or in pain or ill or grieving or homeless or poverty stricken are suffering more than people who are not any of these things, aren't they? It is dogmatic agnosticism to pretend that it is impossible to meaningfully say. Three, nothing follows from making this admission that is in any way a threat to deontological libertarianism. For deontological libertarianism withstands criticism as not clashing in practice with utilitarianism. One can express this by saying that deontological libertarianism provides the rules for rule preference utilitarianism. But Bloch continues that the assumption is crucial to Friedman's entire philosophical edifice, for without it looms the objection of the utility monster who engages in mass murder. I sometimes wonder what books Bloch read as a child. Uh, but he values the death of all human beings more than we, the rest of us, collectively, collectively value our own lives. So he can kill us all and eat us, just for good measure. Every theory is more like a floating boat than a grounded edifice. But does the utility monster criticism clearly sink the boat of utilitarian theory. I first ought to mention, as Bloch does not, that the utility monster was, as far as I know, originally posited as a problem for utilitarianism by Robert Nozick. As I am here engaged in defending my own philosophical response to Friedman, I next ought to outline and elaborate on my own replies to this type of criticism. This is the argument that giving in to people with extreme utility functions of this kind would inevitably result in a competitive evolution of such monsters, with each new generation outwanting the previous one. But they would not end up being any more satisfied than people originally were. In fact, they would almost certainly be more frustrated by their intemperance and lack of stoicism. And this is apart from the loss of utility, that all of the people who were destroyed along the uh, of all of the people who were destroyed along the way to this end state, consequently, the right utilitarian thing to do is not give in to people with intemperate emotions, uh, whenever they are found to exist or usually. Moreover, it seems plausible that humans have evolved to have just the sort of utility functions that maximise their survival and thriving, and hence maximise their utility. We've seen what happens to people who are born without being capable of pain. Terrible things. The idea that this could be changed without detrimental consequences is, in effect, genetic central planning that ignores the spontaneous order that human utility functions are. It is a curious irony that the main error of both critics and advocates of utilitarianism is that neither of them, neither of them gives proper consideration to long-term consequences. However, arguendo, let us suppose that a utility monster could somehow be more sublimely satisfied than the whole of humanity put together. I find it hard to make sense of that supposition. How satisfied could one utility monster be? And if, and if one, why not two, etc.? Anyway, in this fantasy world, then utility and ut liberty would diverge. But that is of no theoretical or practice practical significance as regards the congruence of liberty and utility in the actual world. In footnote 35, Bloch suggests that a different type of utility monster is one for whom the benefits of rape to him outweigh the costs to the victim. Again, the long-term consequences of allowing extreme utility functions to be trumps cannot be to maximise utility. This encourages, in defence or retaliation, the habitual and eventually evolutionary fostering of counterbalancing disutility in potential rape victims. It would, in effect, be an arms race of emotional intemperance. Utility could not plausibly be the winner.
Bloch is not entirely right that this is an extreme example, for very intemperate people, at least, already exist. So the option is already there to give in to them and thereby encourage such habits and ultimately such evolved types of people. But courts should not normally, as I beg your pardon, but courts should normally reject any defence that is based on the alleged presence of an extreme utility function in the accused person. Bloch thinks that it is unlikely, no, impossible, that anyone could ever prove he is a utility monster. On the contrary, we might prove in the sense of test the thesis in a variety of ways. One would be our hedonometer, another would be seeing the extreme sorts of things that a person is prepared to do, including giving or receiving payment, to achieve or avoid some outcome. Consider the extreme behaviour of some users of hard drugs, for instance. Clearly, they have temporarily made themselves into a kind of relatively mild utility monster. However, there is n uh, that is no, no good reason to make them any less liable for any crimes they commit. It is, however, a perfectly good utilitarian reason to fully legalise their drugs, for that would promote both utility and more liberty. Now Bloch turns to an example that he thinks is rather more realistic, the innocent prisoner. He gives a version of the well-known example of a sheriff, a prisoner and a lynch mob. The sheriff has in lock up a black man falsely accused of raping a white woman. The white mob outside the jail demands the prisoner in order to torture and then hang him. If the sheriff accedes to his, this demand, one innocent black man dies. If the jailer refuses, the mob will attack. The, the sheriff will kill half the mob, be murdered himself, and the black prisoner still be lynched. What, oh what, should the sheriff do? Locke replies, the principled libertarian answer is very straightforward. Start shooting at the lynch mob, go down fighting, and the devil take the hindmost. Well, say I, at least wait until they attack first. Perhaps they might not. And why is the sheriff obliged for li libertarian reasons to kill members of the mob and die himself when he knows the situation is hopeless? rather than say, run away. Bloch continues, the Friedmanite utilitarian libertarian will have to take the opposite tack, at least at first glance. The sheriff turns the innocent prisoner, prisoner over to the mob. However, Bloch concedes that Friedman does have a way to avoid this pitfall. If and when word of this gets out, horrid precedents will be set for the future. Lynch mobs will become emboldened. Prisoners will not trust lawmen to protect them. They will thus be less likely to surrender and more likely to try to shoot their way out of being arrested, which means more deaths. Law and order will be brought into disrepute and many more people will die than half this particular one relatively small lynch mob, one innocent prisoner and one sheriff doing his proper job. Exactly. This is not merely a way to avoid this pitfall, but an entirely reasonable account of why this is the correct rule utilitarian position. But Bloch is not satisfied, for there are so many, many ways in which secrecy can be maintained. The world could end right after the monumental injustice took place. A magician could come along and interfere with the memory of half the mob that had survived, plus any bystanders. This episode could more realistically, more realistic me mind, have taken place in an isolated area with no children, where no one else would ever hear of the sheriff's malfeasance, and all the surviving elderly members of the mob soon die. Or we could suppose any of these to be true, arguendo. Yes, of course, arguendo, a clash between liberty and utility is possible in a fantasy and it will even occur from time to time in reality. So what? The systematic, practical congruence of liberty and utility is what matters. And this is good news. We humans can have the best of both worlds, and libertarians and utilitarians ought to be allies. The eyes have it. Next block tackles one of the classic body parts criticisms of utilitarianism, 
He suggests that it would be utilitarian if David Friedman were forced to give up one of his eyes to someone who is blind. And as he has not done so voluntarily, he fails to be a consistent utilitarian libertarian. Several responses. One, to advocate an ideology for a society is not to commit oneself to trying to live by it personally, whether or not the ideology is adopted by a society. Two, if one were to try to live by it personally without social adoption, then might well, one might well suffer the costs without enjoying the benefits. Why should there be an obligation on a sincere advocate, a victim of the system, and no one else, the perpetrators of the system? Three, there are obvious moral hazards in making transplants of eyes, etc., compulsory. People will not look after themselves with as much care. Four, any serious attempt to make such things compulsory would quite possibly result in an armed struggle between the government and the people until the policy is abandoned after much utility had been inflicted. Five, <coughs> most important of all, a far more utilitarian and libertarian practical solution in reality is allowing free markets in all body parts, including eyes. Fantasy clashes between liberty and utility are of no theoretical or practical significance. Right, almost at the end. Anti-market regulation. Block notes Friedman's free market anarchist credentials, but he objects that Friedman bases his viewpoint on these matters on utilitarian, not deontological or principled libertarian grounds. Consequently, if the few winners of these dirigism, is that right, dirigism? Dirigism. 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 <laughs> These dirigism institutions count more heavily than many losers. Then this author would be precluded from uh, defending even these elementary and basic aspects of the free uh, enterprise philosophy. And so Bloch asks, in what sense then can Friedman's views even be considered libertarian? And, he, and the correct reply must be that someone is a libertarian if he advocates universal interpersonal liberty. What more or less could be needed? And this Friedman does do, albeit with an implicit and approximate theory of liberty, as most libertarians have, including Bloch himself. Hence Friedman is a libertarian. One's motives for advocating universal liberty are a separate matter. According to Bloch, though, Friedman is only a libertarian if we posit equal liberties for all people and I see you. We can demonstrate, based on these assumptions, that these interferences with the market hurt more people and more, more seriously than they help. As we have seen, we do not need to posit equal utilities for all people to arrive at free market conclusions. Moreover, Bloch is equating markets with liberty without any explanation as to their alleged identity. Nevertheless, both Bloch and Friedman do advocate liberty in their own implicit and confused ways. Of course, Friedman simply has no warrant for these assumptions, neither does Bloch for his assumptions, for assumptions need no warrants, and warrants would be epistemologically worthless in any case. So it is true that Friedman's intellectual edifice is based on nothing at all. So is Bloch's, so is everyone's. That is one consequence of critical rationalism uh, being the true epistemology. But as long as we are prepared to take criticism seriously, then there is a chance of discovering, discovering errors in our conjectures. And that is another consequence of critical rationalism's being the true epistemology. Conclusion. Bloch finishes by upbraiding Friedman for not giving proper references and quotations. Instead, he criticised what some libertarian or other said about something that Friedman overheard. And Bloch asserts, asserts somewhat harshly that Friedman's practice is a disgrace to good scholarship. <laughs> However, he also then congratulates Friedman for giving, a good, giving deontological libertarianism a good run for its money. There is no principled libertarian who can hold this position without being able to deal with Friedman's excellent, although mistaken, objections.
Yes, there is a difference between being a scholar and being a thinker, though they partly complement each other. And Friedman would have done slightly better to have more real quotations where possible. However, as we have seen, Bloch himself tacitly draws upon much philosophical literature without quotations or references. But I note that Bloch's bibliography runs to almost 10 pages, uh, almost entirely of his own works. <laughs> so I do not impugn his credentials as a scholar. And I thank him for his stimulating, although mistaken, arguments. As we have seen, a proper theory of liberty combined with critical, a critical rationalist approach can solve Friedman's philosophical, philosophical problems in a far more convincing manner than the approximations and ad hoc additions of Rothbardism. <clears throat> and now I have a brief appendix. Is there one appendix? A brief one. Uh, <clears throat> replies to two commentators. I have had a couple of responses to a draft of this paper. It seems plausible that the reactions of these two libertarian commentators are not untypical, but I see no reason to significantly alter what I've written as a result. Consequently, in case there are people who have similar opinions, I think it might be helpful to reply briefly to their arguments here. First commentator. This paper reads like an arbitrary selection of unrelated topics. After reading the paper, I have no idea what it is trying to do and what its intended contribution is. So I should have put that in quotations. My reply, the abstract is new, but the purpose of the paper is clearly and briefly stated in the opening paragraph. Why is that explanation simply ignored? Let me put it another way. I don't think this paper passes the so what test. Let us say that Bloch's arguments are faulty. Why does it matter? <laughs> Why does it matter in a libertarian scholarly periodical that a leading libertarian's arguments are faulty? What could matter more in that context? What is the significance of Bloch's errors? If they are errors, then they cannot be used to explain and defend libertarianism as Bloch intends, along with many other Rothbardians. Do they mean that utilitarian libertarianism can be re rehabilitated? That deontological libertarianism is flawed? That critical rationalist libertarianism is a good alternative? Putting some nuances aside, the paper answers no, yes and yes to these questions. So why does the commentator ask them again rather than criticise the arguments concerning those, argue those answers? Papers such as this need to take special care not to simply criticise, but to create. This is an odd remark on two levels. First, there is nothing wrong with simply criticising alleged errors by trying to show that they are errors. There is no intellectual obligation to come up with a better alternative. Second, in each and every case, it just so happens that an alternative theory was offered. Perhaps that is what the author intended to do with the references to critical rationalism, but this is unclear. Critical rationalism was clearly explained and clearly applied where relevant, but it was offered as an alternative only to the relevant parts of Bloch's arguments. This reader is still left wondering what this paper is trying to add to our understanding. The reviewer is conflating, conflating his own response with alleged confusion in the paper. In each case, the paper seeks to show what is wrong with the Blochian Rothbardian orthodoxy in response to David Friedman's problems and then seeks to offer a better, albeit heterodox, solution. Second commentator. This paper strikes me as rather random. I reply to Bloch's points in the order in which he makes them. How is that random? Bloch's papers tend to address many different topics, and his critique of Friedman is no different, coming across as rather disconnected. The problem is that because of this, the present paper critiquing Bloch is even more disjointed. Bloch deals with a series of relatively unconnected issues in Friedman's justly famous and influential book, 
I can't see why it is a problem that they are unconnected, and so why it is a problem that replies to them are similarly unconnected. The reviewer does not explain how there is a problem with having disconnected points. Does he think that in some way a paper should always have a single unifying principle that applies to every single point? I can't see why. Either Bloch's paper should never have been allowed in its current form, which seems unreasonable, there's nothing wrong with its form as far as I can see, or applies to it in a similar form, should be allowed. The section based on Bloch's introduction seems irrelevant. The arguments made in this section have nothing to do with Bloch's paper on Friedman. The section based on Bloch's introduction is relevant precisely because it replies to crucial points that are made by Bloch in the introduction to his paper on Friedman. So I cannot see how they have nothing to do with Bloch's paper on Friedman. They are views Bloch expresses in many places and which are conventionally held by other libertarians as well. In particular here we're talking about deontologism and consequentialism. It is not relevant that Bloch expresses these views in many places. It is even more clearly not relevant that they are conventionally held by other libertarians as well. They are in his paper and I wish to contest them. It is bizarre to think that it is not legitimate to do so. As I read through the rest of the paper, I realised that this problem appears several times. Many of Bloch's arguments are briefly and weakly presented in his paper on Friedman, whereas they are developed further and more coherently in other places, for instance in, Bloch, in Rothbard's works and Bloch's own writings. I can't see anything wrong with Bloch outlining his views and giving references to more detailed discussions, and therefore I can't see anything wrong with someone replying in a similar fashion, as I do. I conclude that the specific project of this paper, a reply to Bloch on Friedman, is misguided. I find it misguided that someone can think that a published scholarly paper can have been written in such a way that any attempt to reply to it is misguided. If the author wishes to establish critical rationalism as a viable alternative to other views, missing there. Uh, they said that, I think he goes on to say, then he should have written a separate paper attempting to establish it. 22. The reply to Bloch is about a host of issues, as is Bloch's original article, and certainly not only about critical rationalism. Moreover, the reviewer fails to understand critical rationalism if he thinks that any advocate would attempt to establish critical rationalism. Uh, or the author wishes to criticise others for unduly neglecting it. I wish to point out uh, that critical rationalism exists and what it is. This will be interesting news for some people. The paper should have been written as a standalone piece, not as a reply. But the paper is clearly not about critical rationalism is in particular. That is merely one issue. By the way, Bloch's comments on the two types of libertarianism is a throwaway line and should not be taken as a sustained argument. This is irrelevant. Bloch means what he says and, and so contesting it is, in, is germane and no amount of sustained argument could support it in any case. Further, when discussing critical rationalist libertarianism, the author seems rather upset that Bloch has overlooked it. On the contrary, as I explicitly and sincerely stated, quoting myself, I am very happy to bring Professor Block the good news that there is at least one other philosophy of libertarianism. The reviewer seems rather upset by my mentioning it for reasons that I cannot comprehend. Yet at the same time, the author does not supply the reader with much information about this strand of libertarianism. I explained critical rationalism and how it applies to libertarianism. And I referred any interested readers to additional reading, as Bloch does himself. All very unexceptionable, I should have thought. The author can hardly object to Bloch overlooking critical rationalist libertarianism if that approach has few exponents or published works to advance it. Why not? It is intellectually irrelevant whether a position has any exponents 
or any published works whatsoever. It is always relevant to point out a criticism. This is, of course, not to imply that Bloch is blameworthy for not having noticed. <coughs> to put it bluntly, the argument comes off as conceited. I have no intellectual reason to contest this allegation. <laughs> because it has nothing to do with the arguments. The author seems to simply be complaining that Bloch has neglected the author's own views, and this is a very grave problem. Not at all. I am arguing that Bloch's responses to Friedman's problems fail for all the reasons that I give, and then I argue for a better alternative in each case. Of course the arguments that I give must in one sense be my views. This is inevitable. Perhaps I could, in principle, excise any references to myself, but just as Bloch refers quite normally and relevantly to his own views and works in replying to Friedman, so I do uh, refer to my own in replying to Bloch. I would hesitate in this comment were it not for the fact that the author makes references to himself or herself throughout the text, awkwardly mentioning his or her own opinion as if this were of intrinsic interest to the reader. Just as Bloch does in his paper, of course, and just as this reviewer does himself, though both seem entirely proper and pertinent to me. In particular, however, the reviewer appears to overlook what the paper is explicitly about. It is a comparison between Bloch's responses to Friedman's philosophical problem and my own very different theor theoretical responses. Therefore, I can hardly fail to mention my own opinions. How can the author declare at the end of the paper that critical rationalism is the true epistemology? Why should I not? That one may assume anything is the first rule of logic. That is certainly not proven in the paper. Of course it isn't. That would be inconsistent with critical rationalism, as I clearly explain at the start of the paper. Also, wouldn't claiming its truth in some way establish it as more than a mere conjecture? Of course not. To assert something as true does not entail that it has been supported in any way. But if the reviewer wishes to disagree with critical rationalism, then why does he not attempt to fault the specific explanation given in the paper? Even this, if this is not the case, the author ends up by saying that there is no basis for libertarianism. But this is very different from saying that any basis for libertarianism is a conjectural one. I puzzled about that. <laughs> a conjecture is not an epistemological basis. And as critical rationalism explains, such a basis is neither possible nor necessary. Perhaps I am misreading the author's words. But the way the author phrases the conclusion makes it sound more like epistemological nihilism. That's what the Randians say about the Populians. I conclude by saying, to quote myself, but as long as we are prepared to take criticism seriously, then there is the chance of discovering errors in our conjectures. I don't see how this hopeful outlook can be reasonably interpreted as epistemological nihilism. Lastly, if none of these approaches is a true basis for libertarianism, because there cannot be a basis for libertarianism or any other type of theory, then why on earth should we care about Bloch or Friedman's arguments? Because we do not need a basis for libertarianism, as I explained in the paper, because the way to seek truth is to, explain, is to expose theories to criticism in the hope of eliminating error. Why does Bloch's view on the innocent prisoner matter if his whole approach to libertarianism is wrong. It is not completely wrong, as I explicitly say in the text, and it is illuminating to see exactly to what extent and how it is wrong. Why does the author feel the need to critique minor points if the systems for which they are relevant must be rejected? I did not attempt a critique in the philosophical sense of an imminent criticism. I offered specific criticisms. None of the issues discussed are minor points. There are no real systems here. And in any case, a legitimate way to refute a so-called system, or overall general theory at least, is to refute the consequences that it implies.
While I welcome both commentators' criticisms, I cannot see that a single one of them has any significant force or shows any evidence of being philosophically informed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they will now. Any questions or comments? It's not a comment. I beat them into submission, except for him. <laughs> um, there are a couple of, um, of Bloch's fantasy examples that actually that, that I've been reading recently that seem to have happened in reality. Um, both of them in Texas. Very peculiar place, Texas, if you read about it. Um, but there was a case last week. This business is about um, yeah. being able to defend your property with lethal, lethal force. Yeah. Apparently, this is a, a law in Texas that you're allowed to do this. Uh, I think the intention being that, yeah, if somebody robs your house and they've, they've got your money and they're running away down the drive, you are allowed to try and shoot them to stop them. You, know, you shouldn't just simply give up to aggressive burglars. And you can be slightly more dis than disproportionate in the... It's, it's not... Are you sure it's when they're running away? Well, well... <laughs> I thought it's, if you catch them inside rather than when well, they're running away. Well, I don't know. Well, this is a case that happened recently in Texas. Uh, a man hired mm. a prostitute and paid her $150. Uh, and she took the $150 and then said she wasn't going to have sex with him. And nor was she going to give him back the money. So he shot her using, uh, when he came to trial, his defense argued that he was using lethal force to recover his property. Yeah. And he was acquitted on the basis, <laughs> on the basis of this law. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> So I think I think yeah I think, I think a lot of a lot of these examples although they seem absolutely ridiculous to us when box rambling on the map uh, are more popular as memes in America yes where they have more of these sorts of laws so they're not quite so uh, so you, you you made a bit of fun out of sort of books that Bob reads but if you do read the American papers. There are a lot of peculiar things that go on in America. But, but then but here <laughs> but here Block has sort of he seems to have give sort of conflicting examples because on the one hand yeah. he talks about doing that, but on the other hand, maybe some utilitarian hero would come along well, exactly. and stop him shooting. The yeah. pros if I, I, as I read through this paper, I, I eventually formed the opinion that perhaps there is a super utilitarian hero in America who's really Walter Block, <laughs> who goes around <laughs> dealing with any libertarian rights clashes in an heroic way <laughs> and, and just escaping in the well, nick of time. It, but if anybody ever catches them, a, a, a jury will let it. It's watch. a preposterous uh, self. It makes it makes it. This this idea that Walter Block has of the the, the, the anti-libertarian hero. The, you have libertarianism, which Rock, which Block is uh, quite painted as absolutely correct in all circumstances. Yeah. Come come what may, you know. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. the heavens fall. Irrelevant to consequences. These libertarian deontological rules from the non-aggression principle are absolutely important. Yet we also need heroes to go around breaching them on a regular basis in order for us maybe to survive death yeah. at various junctures. And, uh, <laughs> and then we should go around, puni then apparently the way we should treat our heroes is to punish them severely uh, afterwards. Uh, yeah. uh, so, 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 so I mean, all you can conclude from this is that this block is confused. Well, and, and you simply, you, you, you highlight the yeah. confusion, you explain it, and you yeah. explain where it's confused and where it's going wrong, and you offer superior. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, uh, I think it, what, what, he's, what he's trying to do, though, is he's defending the most extreme cases because uh, they're worried about a slippery slope. As soon as you yeah. say you can have one except then you can have another, and then next thing you know, uh, redistributing money for <laughs> reasons of welfare. So he, in, in order to stop that happening, he says you've got to take it all the way. But I was um, discussing this with a friend online the other day. And uh, in practical terms, what's more likely is if you say that there are absolute libertarian rights and that's that, for a start you're just going to appear unreasonably dogmatic uh, and you're not going to convince anybody. And if there were to be such rights, then those rights are far more likely to be broken. And once you break them, then uh, that more or less falsifies them as rights. Mm. Whilst if you say they're strong prima facie rights, but obviously 
you know, uh, if they're in, if in extreme enough circumstances we set them aside, then you can, they stay intact. I mean, you can, there's no, we hope you, have, you don't abandon them in any way because you say, well, in order to save somebody's life, uh, I, I took the gun and shot the murderer. Uh, that you, you don't need to maintain the facade of their absoluteness. No. Uh, that's what, more or less no, what you're trying to do. You, yeah. you need a, some sort of Olympian hero to uh, <coughs> yeah. go around preaching them for you. <laughs> <So> what? Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, there is, it, it's not theoretically satisfactory. And, no. no. Um, and this, uh, but what is in Block is not much different from what is in Rothbard. And um, it's sort of, uh, you should follow arguments across subject boundaries, I suppose, as Popper says. Um, but if your background is completely in economics and then you try and do some philosophy, you're more likely to make a pig's ear of it than if you just say, well, I'd leave that to the philosophers, yeah. which, of course, is what David Friedman says. Mm. He says, I perceive all these philosophical problems, I don't know what the answer is, and I can't, I'm not going to try. And I, I, I think... Um, well, your, your, yeah. your, your, your attempt at philosophy, you look at, it's such a big deal, it's, it's an obviously crass big deal. Uh, Roderick Long manages to make a more elegant big deal of it, who is a philosopher. Uh, the, the other, the other I probably example. ought to have said dog's breakfast. That's yeah. right. <laughs> the other example. A dog could breakfast on a pig's ear. <laughs> yes. The other yes. example, from, also from Texas, um, and it Waco, a very dangerous place, Waco, yeah. if you read about it. Uh, not only was the, the, the recent massacre uh, that the uh, Janet Reno and Dolphin yeah. on fresh reasons, but back at the turn of the century, this precise example about the, the black um, falsely accused person that, yes. uh, in Waco, they, uh, they arrested a some black chap for supposedly raping a white woman and before he even got to trial, a massive mob, huge, all the, all the white people in town did turn out, they stormed the uh, jail, dragged him out and uh, yeah. tortured him for hours by burning him, uh, hanging him, putting him on a rope, hanging him over a bonfire, looking up and down, sort of slowly burning him to death before they killed him. But this did go on uh, and the sheriff, nobody, nobody intervened and nobody was arrested afterwards either, none of the law authorities bothered to follow mm -hmm. up. It was, it was a scandal around the world. I think it occurred during the First World War, so it might have been a bit valuable mm. to Horace as that. Uh, but it was a scandal around the world, and it was sort of no, and there was a lot of shame involved as well. But um, yeah. in turn, I don't know much or anything else that happened, but it, it was more or less dusted over, so, but in terms of the practical long-term consequences. But that, that's, that is, it's not just technical fact, that is a real example like that. It, well, the, the, uh, that did happen. Yeah. What I've come to called redneck libertarianism is a big thing in America yeah. and uh, recently I've been writing, uh, I've written something for libertarianism.org and some of the critics who write in just, they more or less don't want, they don't want to know anything about any of this philosophy at all you know, I know what the non-aggression principle means and that's that Shooting. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's a uh, uh, it's uh, no, no, no. as, I, as, I, as I, I said to one of them. I, I, I'm not saying that you're not a libertarian. Uh, you don't have to agree with me, but uh, a redneck libertarian is still a libertarian. Yes. Well, I apologise if you don't think you're lost lecture. So if you did, just tell me to, 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 to be quiet. Um, right at the beginning of Brock's paper. He states this as follows. Yeah. He says, Friedman starts off by attributing to many libertarians the view that it, it is, quote, it is always wrong to initiate coercion. Yeah. He then states quite harshly, I defy Friedman or anyone else to cite any reputable libertarian, car libertarian, who ever published anything of that sort. That's how he starts off his paper, but yeah. I don't sort of problem with that. And I think it's in some ways contradictory, but maybe you can explain because elsewhere in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, Locke himself said in the, in the same year, in volume 22, 2011, he says that libertarian law is guided by the non-aggression axiom, which stipulates that it ought to be legal for adults to do whatever they please, provided that they do not aggress against a person or, or a property of another. And he states clearly, he said, essentially asked, libertarianism are essentially asked but one single solitary question and gives one single solitary answer. The question, under what conditions is the use of force of violence legally justified? And the answer, only in response 
uh, to the prior, basically to the prior use of force. Yeah. So it seems to me that his first thing, he says, like, nobody says anything of the sort. And the second in paper, he said, you know, I, now you could, I think semantically you could... No, I know, I know, I know, um, I think you're overlooking the, um, if you read what he says carefully, what he's objecting to is uh, that uh, David Friedman seems to think that libertarianism is about morals and Bloch's position is it's a, it's a theory of law it's got, and it's got nothing to do with morals which is a um, slightly eccentric position that isn't the reason that it's false but it is false I think it's not, it's yeah, just, not it's, just I mean it's a theory of what the law ought to be but it's, libertarianism is an ideology uh, the idea that libertarianism is a theory of law is a is a strange way of putting it. So effectively, what you're saying is when uh, Block says that, or accuses Freeman saying that uh, uh, you should should never uh, initiate force, he's saying that it's that's a moral argument. Oh no no! The, the, what what he objects to when when he quotes Friedman, I I, I wondered what he was going on about first because he objecting to the initiation of force. But no, what he's objecting to is is that Friedman is moralising. The argument that, free, that, 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 that uh, Friedman thinks that, that libertarians think it's immoral, and, and Bloch is saying, no, it's got nothing to do with morals. We're talking about law here, it's not morals, and that's that's his point. It, it, you, it you double take when you read it because you think, what what's his point here? Then you, you, eventually uh, you, you see it, and then of course he goes on at length to to repeat. It's all about law. Morals are irrelevant, unless we need a hero, of course. If you if you need a moral hero, ah, oh, there's something else. But that but libertarianism is just law. Thank you, Bob. Uh, firstly, the um, if the sheriff is a consequentialist utilitarian, he will shoot the black man because the black man will suffer the least pain. He's going to cop it anyway, and he hasn't got to open fire on the rest of the crowd. I wouldn't like to be in this position, but um, that would... Well, that's one. Yes. That, that man's on the chest. It's one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't have to respond to that one immediately. Yeah. Um, I have been, as you may know, when I bored our speaker with it some, some years ago, probably 25, I was operating, um, attempting a kind of um, consequentialist opportunityism. Uh, approach to libertarianism. Mm. Some of that is a kind of uh, utilitarian yes. approach to the yes. matter. And um, I tried to spin everything out that you would want to get out of it. Mm. Um, whether this was a moral matter or a matter of um, applied economics, it seems to me as well. So, it, so uh, this question that it's, oh, it's not morality, it's law, mm. I think you said this at the last meeting, yeah. it's precisely your, your moral approach, yeah. analysis, that gives you the the reason to support this or that law. Mm -hmm. Or, as I go further and say, it's not so much the law as the, it's an institutional um, consequentialism. It's, it's an institutional, so it's the source of the laws. It's a mm -hmm. kind of broader picture saying we have those things and they're likely to reduce the, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. the greatest happens, the greatest number, I'll put it that way, but mm -hmm. could do it that way. Um, so, so you have a, it's the morality leading to the, the law and institutions for establishing the law, correcting the law, yeah. enforcing the law. Hmm. Not sure there's a question there. But, uh, okay, in that case, I'm not sure there's an answer. Uh -huh. yeah. Is there anyone else who has any questions? Is there something? Hang on. Yeah. Well, I suppose we'll continue the discussion in the bar then. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for coming along. I hope you come along to the next meeting, which is the talk on Bitcoin. 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 <laughs> Bitcoin. 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 B